Welcome to After Dark, Nocturnal Landscapes and Public Spaces of the Arabian Peninsula. I'm Anita Berisbeitia, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the GSD. This conference is a collaboration between the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Aga Khan program at the GSD, and the Department of Landscape Architecture. I want to welcome my colleagues from uh, other departments at the university, as well as from MIT, uh, but also want to thank our speakers that have come from a very long way to talk with us today. I look forward to your insights on topics uh, that are of concern to all of us across so many fields. We rarely explore night landscapes, and typically well-lit landscapes work to extend the day rather than to augment the experience of the night. <coughs> Such an experience would force our primary perceptual apparatus, vision, to recede and give way to perception through sounds, sense, intuition, tactility, the skin, and the almost dizzying and destabilizing sensation that comes when one loses all reference to scale. The excellent presentations yesterday spoke about night spaces as liminal. Liminal spaces that promote unplanned social engagement, transgressions that work against the behaviors imposed all too often by design. After all, it is our mandate to design for accessibility for all and for safety. Yet they left us wondering, how do we define these spaces? What are they? How do we account for them as designers? Who pays for them? And what are the different ways we can know them? The realities of climate change will make us reconsider the design of public spaces for use after dark. These landscapes hold the potential for creating new forms of subjectivities, new spaces of democracy that admit difference and heterogeneity, and that will present themselves in stark contrast to the sanitized spaces of capitalist consumption. And the deliberations today will shed light uh, on these issues. And for this, I have to uh, thank Gareth Doherty, our assistant professor and senior research associate at the GSD, who has uh, organized uh, this symposium and who will tell us a little bit more about what's ahead for us today. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Anita, for supporting the conference and for enabling it to, to happen. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, it's, it's amazing to see so many people here from different parts of the world and people that I only ever met in Kuwait or, or Dubai. Um, in my brief words of introduction, I just wanted to do three things. Uh, to talk about briefly how the conference came about, um, what I hope we're going to achieve today, and where I hope we go from here. Um, as I said yesterday, even though the conference has a focus on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we really wanted to we really want to bring the discussions into landscape architecture and urban design more, more generally. So how the conference came about, as many of you know, I, I spent a year living in Bahrain doing field work. And during that time, I would walk uh, every day. I found that, that walking was a great way to meet the unexpected. And for me, one of the most unexpected things that I met during my time in Bahrain was the fact that most of my life was conducted during the nighttime. And in fact, most of my social life and in fact, a lot of my fieldwork was done at night. Yet, when I look at the images in the book, they were all during the day. And as I said yesterday, this is partly for, for technical reasons, um, but also, I'm not sure how to advance the... Um. <laughs> ah. It's partly for technical reasons, um, because you know it's obviously harder to photograph it 
in the night time. Um, but it was also because I think my training um, biased me towards the daytime. So as designers, we're often focused on designing for, for daytime, for midday in the summer, but what about the night? And these questions were on my mind as, as the book was impressed. It was too late to change the images. And so we started thinking about organizing the, this event to correct this wrong, in a way. Um, I realized that my days in Bahrain were like those of many Bahrainis. I would get up in the morning, early in the morning. I would hear the call to prayer. I would go out. I would go to a ministry. I would go to have meetings. I would spend the afternoon resting, preparing for the evening. And in the evening, I would go out. And that's when sort of my, my life really um, took place. But uh, the, the late afternoon, though, this zone between day and night, I find probably one of the most magical parts of the day here, as well as in Bahrain. When the golden sun is waning was when I would take, actually, most of my photographs. And in fact, Fuad Khoury, the Lebanese anthropologist who spent a lot of time in Bahrain, uh, declared that the charm of nature in Bahrain and throughout the Arabian desert was best seen at dawn or dusk when the sun touches the earth most gently. So let me talk a minute about what I hope we get out of the conference or what, or what I hope we achieve today. The conference has four panels and yesterday we had our first. I think many of you were there. Um, the focus was on nocturnal activities in, in public space or in public spaces. Uh, we had three presentations, uh, one on uh, class and public spaces in Kuwait, another on um, migrant workers and typologies of their public spaces in the UAE, and one on gay cruising in Saudi Arabia. I thought that the, the questions were particularly enlightening. We heard questions on how new technologies, social media, has an impact on public space. Um, we heard questions on spontaneity. If a spontane spontaneous event takes place every day, then is it spontaneous? And we heard a question on, I guess, what basically asked, so what? What, what, what do we do with this information? What do designers and planners do? And I think that's the, sort of the biggest question I would like us to to ask in the conference. Um, today we have three panels, one on uh, designing for darkness, the second on, on narratives of the night, what narratives do we use to describe the night visually and, and, and otherwise. And we'll end with a, a panel on new nocturnal landscapes in the Arabian Peninsula. These are some of the keywords that we asked the, the speakers uh, to, um, to give us. So this gives you a, a flavor of what we might expect today. Um, but I just wanted to say that I wanted to end with, with, with two points because I think in my year of field work, I, I realized that landscape in the Arabian Peninsula, or at least as I came to understand it, is a word most, mostly associated with the contrast of constructed green to an indigenous arid environment. But how do we as, as landscape architects and urban designers from, let's say, the so-called West practice in that type of environment? Do we bring our own values or do we adapt to, um, to social norms uh, in the Arabian Peninsula? And secondly, how do we, how can we learn from the Arabian Peninsula where actually there are different words for landscape and how does that inform and enrich and expand the practice of landscape architecture and urban design here? And for me, that's probably the biggest question that I would like to ask uh, over the next uh, few hours. So thank you 
very much uh, for coming. Um, and uh, I just wanted to introduce Belinda Tato, uh, a friend and, and colleague, uh, who will moderate the first session on Designing for Darkness. Uh, Belinda is a design critic in, in landscape architecture here at, at the GSD, and with Jose Luis Vallejo is the founder and director of Ecosistema Urbano, who have the wonderful uh, practice of, of urban social design, which I, I think is a, 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 a wonderful aspiration. So, Belinda, thank you very much for agreeing to, to moderate the panel. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you for the invitation. It's my great pleasure and I really hope to have a very inspiring day and journey through all these different topics. And personally, I'm very interested in this, um, in this topic because we designers can, can have a lot of effect and a lot of impact in public space. And in this particular kind of climatic context, I'm also very intrigued about how climate actually shapes our lives, shapes the way we build, shapes the way we actually interact with each other. So I really hope we, we get a feeling of that. So I will have the pleasure to have a debate with um, the following persons. So we have here today Nasser Abu Hassan, is co-principal of Agi Architects with offices in both Kuwait and Madrid. Abu, Abu Hassan's doctoral dissertation was entitled Light, Site and Architecture. We also have Maha Al-Dahari, is a member of Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Council. She has an MA degree from NYU Abu Dhabi. We also have Anna Gritsting, somewhere in the room. She's an assistant professor of architecture and urban design at Qatar University. Her research interests include border landscape, contested space, and place memory. We have Joaquin Pérez Goicochea, who's actually a classmate from my school back in the 90s sometime. He's co-principal together with um, his colleague of Agi Architects with offices in, in Kuwait and Madrid, and, and Joaquin holds a Master in Architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design and a Master in Urban Design from the School of Madrid. And we have Todd Reis, who is there, and who is the Daniel Rose Visiting Assistant Professor at Yale University. He's an architect and writer focusing on the cities of the Gulf region, and he's also the editor of Almanac, Almanac to golf continue. So I'm just looking forward to listen to their presentations and I really hope we can have a very fruitful conversation afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the GSD. Thank you to the Architecture and Landscape Department. Uh, for us, this is going back to our home. As Belinda said, we just started here uh, a couple of years ago, and it's a great pleasure to be back. Today, uh, we are going to talk about the transformation of the city of Kuwait and how from uh, a port city, uh, that lived with very little means, it became a cosmopolitan city. And what has been the implication uh, on the, that society and especially in our practice? Uh, we are dealing with, we will explain certain projects, only three projects, in which uh, that relates to a very specific part of that society. But for us, uh, it really represents uh, uh, what is the the imaginary of, of, the, of that society. Uh, Kuwait, uh, I think Farah uh, Nakib explained yesterday, I don't know, she's really an expert on, on the history of Kuwait. Mm, okay, it was a, a very small town uh, that lived on, on commerce, uh, on pearl commerce, and uh, with a, a traditionally structured Okay, that remained like that from the 18th century until 1940s. The main social spaces were the port, uh, that was the main access to the, to the city, and then the souk, okay, the souk, and, and then the, 
what is the the private spaces or the the households itself uh, that uh, were structured especially around uh, family binding that uh, here for instance you see uh, a typical kuwaiti house in which uh, we have the the, the kuwaiti houses like many uh, traditional islamic architecture was structured by by the courtyards that uh, not only uh, allow them to bring light you know and into the, the living spaces at the same time that keeping its own privacy towards the outside but uh, structure the, the social activities. This is the, the public courtyard, this is the kitchen courtyard, and this is the family courtyard, for instance. In Kuwait, most of the houses had between two to three courtyards and until the wealthy families that reached to five. Uh, the issue was that when oil was discovered, uh, it happens a huge transformation, uh, not only uh, economically, but uh, especially and especially uh, socially. Uh, the the city center was uh, slowly from the 40s onwards uh, destroyed uh, people were uh, moved out of the city center into the different districts that happen around what is uh, you see around the old city center you know how it grows until we reach the situation today that okay the city has span all along the coast uh, what happened is uh, they implemented a model, uh, a model very alienated from the traditional culture of, of Kuwait. Uh, it's a low density sprawl model imported from the um, okay from the states. Or uh, although they were uh, British, it was a, a British company who did the, the first master plan but with huge implications uh, on the daily life of people. The, the city was structured through, I mean, along different districts, and the districts that uh, they were all residential districts that they had only as a public space, uh, as a kind of district center that they had a mosque, uh, a supermarket, uh, some other small businesses, and in some cases, okay, a police station or things like that. No, but the rest, uh, as you see, uh, was really based on on that car connectivity, and and the rest of the the spaces, the, the public spaces, uh, were really limited to what what is the the, the spaces in, in front of the house, so very limited spaces. So this is the space that we are dealing with, no, uh, as uh, sorry, uh, in our daily practice. Mm which uh, makes us uh, be, you know, to understand the public space in, in, a, in a different way. It's true that right now in Kuwait there are certain public spaces, like okay, the Avenue Mall, that is one of these malls, one kilometer long mall, um, the same as uh, Shahid Park, no? but these spaces, they are, um, it's not that they are artificial spaces, but they are spaces that they are politically controlled in a way that, for instance, here, even in the park, you cannot smoke. No? So it's restricted to certain codes imposed uh, by whoever. No? Either uh, in this case is the, the local government, in the other case is the developer. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to talk only uh, about uh, the locals in in Kuwait and a special part, uh, a specific uh, part of that society. Uh, we are not going to talk about uh, foreigners, which is another big topic, uh, because it will be uh, also we our practice is it relates to them, but in another fashion, and mm, mainly we are going to talk about how we understand this uh, interactive social space and where, for us, we believe it happens. It's true that uh, there are many restaurants and, and bars you know, that, uh, in which accommodates these activities, especially at night, uh, that relates to okay, the shisha uh, activities, which is, is extremely interesting, though, know, because a lot of the, the even commercial activities happens around uh, these conversations, or for instance, in this case, like a football match. In Kuwait, football is a big issue and, and is ex extremely relevant, so it congregates a lot of people around that activity. 
So we'll, we'll actually, the way we have structured this, we'll use some of the work of our practice to try to clearly uh, explain the various uh, way people are actually living uh, at night. So as, as, as stated earlier, the, um, the house is actually the core uh, place where people are actually living, but also socializing. The different ways people commute between the city is driven through these motorways that we saw earlier, and these are very congested motorways. So to leave the house is not a practice that people would like to do often. So they limit that leaving the house to the early morning or later on in the evening, which we'll explain later. But within the house, you've actually ho holding different types of social activities. Some of them are more semi-public, which is in places like the douanias, which are open to invited and uninvited guests, and others which are very specific to guests or friends which are very close to you. Uh, we tried to map out in, a, in, a, in a, the whole day and try to figure out based on the hours of the day what people do. So depending on the temperature, uh, because of the temperature, the work hour starts very early, so at 7.30 people should be at work, and they'll be done around 2.30. Of course, these times are plotted against the prayer times, which is actually a way to begin to structure your day. And so by 2.30, 3.30 max, everyone is at home, they are had lunch, they begin to rest, which is what I mentioned earlier, and in that rest period, people are mostly indoors. And they're indoors because of what we mentioned prior, that the homes were designed in ways that are completely internal, with very, very minimal views to the outside, and with issues related to privacy, people became completely introverted in that part of the day. Uh, what's interesting is the day starts over again at 7 p.m., where people want to leave, or they begin to host. The difference is leaving, you are leaving to go to either uh, a mall, which is like the image we showed earlier, or going to uh, a souk to actually sit down and have a, a social event. But most of the people actually go to homes. And what do they do in homes? We'll use these three projects to identify. This is a project that we recently finished. Uh, we call it Nirvana House. It's actually more than a house. It's more of a, for us, it's like a boutique hotel. It's whatever you want to call it. It's actually quite a large project uh, in terms of built up area. We have around uh, 50,000 square feet, so 5,000 square meter built up area within a 2,000 square meter property. The client here is the youngest person in the house is four years old, and the oldest person in the house is actually 80 years old, which is the father, and this is his youngest son. And uh, the reason why I'm stating that, because each one and everyone in between, which is actually a family of six, require a different way of socializing and require different people to come in and out of the house to socialize with them. So the house was structured around seven different courtyards, and these courtyards begin their outdoor spaces that we begin to give privacy, give uh, and organize the social spaces or the social landscapes around them. Uh, in terms of prog program, uh, you could see the house, for example, one third of it is actually revolving around social activities that the mother could do. Okay, another part of the house actually where the father could have his social activities. The in-between Okay, is something that is not talked about. But of course, we begin to use external areas, part of our design, to mesh these, uh, this in-between area. In the upper floor, which is in the first floor, where we actually made an outdoor pool, external sitting areas, for the family to be able to allow them to come together in a family living area, which is different than actually where they come along with, this is actually where the girl, which is their daughter, has her own living space and her own external landscape. So the repetitive program that we have begins to create these uh, interesting uh, social landscapes that we begin to come. Even with the father here, he has his own, his own space uh, to live. The mother has her own space to live, but actually they share a courtyard here and another courtyard here that for them to come together with. And I haven't yet spoken about the 
people that work in the house and their outdoor spaces also. So the house itself, when we begin to explore it from the outside, is actually quite uh, a private house. That is something that is very important within this landscape. How do you create privacy? And then the, big, the minute you start to get closer to the house, it begins to open up to have these very large settings where a group of 20 to 30 people could come together. And the way they interact, the way they sit together, creates a specific type of environment for people to talk. So whoever is sitting here, he will be talking and everyone should be listening to him. So it's a specific, it's a specific way of socializing. Again, this is the, the father's duania, which is the father's sitting area, where, again, he has a relationship with the outside and, and he hosts people in a more casual fashion here. This is where the daughter hosts her friends and her relationship to the external landscape, to her two rooms. So, again, the type of environment begins to change. And what's important is throughout the house we have multiple areas where we began to define through uh, landscape, through architecture, to bring the family together and visually it. More of the uh, outdoor area for the family itself where we actually began to organize them around this uh, water feature, the pool, to, uh, to give them a more pleasant environment to socialize around during the day and at night. Okay, now we are going to talk uh, another project of ours that we call it the Three Garden House. As Nasser was mentioning before, there, there was you know, this transfer of these social activities into the houses made the, the clients to have very specific demands. No? In this case, uh, the client wanted uh, to, to live in a garden. In a garden for two reasons. One, because they they really like to live in a garden, but also because in the imaginary you know, of, of of Kuwait, uh, most of our clients they always come with these images saying no, uh, no, and they are images from Switzerland normally. No, say I want something like that, you know? and they say uh, okay, yes, but <laughs> your surroundings are not like that. So uh, we had to kind of. Uh, replicate uh, that, that imaginary, you know, uh, multiplying the number of, of landscapes. So instead of having one garden, one landscape, we say, why don't we do three for them? And we really stack them one on top of the other ones, which at the same time allow us to uh, allow the family to participate of the whole house all through the year. In this case, the, the family is not as active socially as in the previous case. The previous case is the typical uh, family, you know, Kuwaiti family, that it's constantly entertaining. When we say constantly, it means that in that house you could find 50 to 100 people uh, on a daily basis. So this is why for us these become the social spaces, real the social spaces of, of the city. But in this case, it's a family that is more quiet, very much interested on, on their own experience in, within this landscape. So uh, we had the, the basement, what we call the basement, that we call it the, the, the summer garden, that uh, it relates to this idea of, of the cave. And we have certain uh, spaces, I oh, know, sorry, uh, it's flipped. Uh, let me go to the basement, yeah. Uh, so we have certain spaces that very much relate to what is the, the family activity. So very much, they're very much private for them. Then, well, let me go back. Okay. Then we have what we call the the water garden that is then in between in between the the summer garden and the winter garden. That's the upper the upper deck, and that. Socially, is where major activities happen. We have uh, two formal uh, living areas, a formal dining area, and then a family together with a, a kitchen uh, sitting area and a pool area that uh, is for 
type of, of people you know, that's close to that that comes, but they, they should be close to the family. Also, we have here what they call the the cigar corner because it's one of the the type of demands that the clients you know want and say no, I want. Uh, part of that landscape has to you know, fulfill my requirements, and it's it's this. Uh, he's, he's, uh, the, the the father really loves to smoke cigars, and I want to have a specific space for it. So they start to uh, identify or determine you know, what type, how this this landscape should be. And then we have the the upper deck that is uh, an in between. The room starts uh, at the first floor level and goes into the the terrace. That for us is the the we call it the winter garden because it really relates to the a new experience. You could only uh, stay there in winter, um, and it relates to this relationship with the with the sky and, and the views towards the, the sea that it has. Here you clearly see how the, these three landscapes are structured with the summer garden, the, the water garden, and the, and the winter garden. The summer garden in which, okay, it's, it's even the materiality of it, it relates more to that experience of the cave. You know, with this space, this is a, a duania that opens up into this, uh, no, here you have the water feature that we were seeing in the previous image. No? And then the, what is the, the water garden that is the, the core of the house, no? even mm, everything revolves around it. The, 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 the mother of the house likes to swim, but at the same time the water is a strong element in the, okay, in the Islamic wall. So uh, it's uh, a very prominent ele element in this case. This relationship, you see, all through the house, in between inside and outside, we tried to kind of um, break them you know, in a way that there's no barriers between one or the other ones. It's a one continuous space. And for us, okay, this is uh, the, the, the part that how we see you know, when the house gets active, is normally, as Nasa was mentioning before, it's at night, you know, and how the this central space, you know, together with this all the social spaces around the, that they are looking into the, the water feature, uh, the, the whole life of the house turns around, social life of the house turns around at these spaces. And the upper deck, which is very specific, you know, and is mainly uh, okay. It relates to what I was saying before, to that relationship towards the outside. It's the moment that the house, the only moment that the house looks towards the outside, and especially uh, towards the sea, there's a, a view towards the sea there at the end. We use this. Uh, these lights, we don't have, I don't think we have, uh, yeah, okay. This light also in, in the outside, no, to, to bring like a, a barrier, a luminous barrier in, in front of uh, no, the, the, the people that could be passing through, through, the, through, through the streets. And just, okay, two images of how it's uh, the, the 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 house works uh, at night when it's really when it's it takes over you know, this whole activity it doesn't show there's supposed to be something that says weekends here so <laughs> but we can't see it okay on weekends actually the activity is completely change and uh, depending on the season Depending on the season, people actually use, the, use either the camps, which is the desert camps, or they use... Uh, the Latif will talk later. Yeah, about it. And uh, the, the beach houses. Beach houses are particularly for certain types of people that use summer pl some of these for weekend activities. This particular project has about 8,000 square meter built up area. It's a family that uses this space excessively. And what they begin to use this space is actually they move in to this house for the weekend. So moving in meaning there is 24 people of staff that move in. There is a huge family of eight people plus their guests, which range between 20 to 
30 or 50 even sometimes. But what, what's special about it is that during the day, it's actually the sea that governs the social activities. And during the night, it's where they begin to use the landscape around the house to uh, attract the people and uh, have these different types of events. What is special about it is actually the fluctuation of people coming in. So when we designed this house, we have accesses not going through the building, around the property to come in and to come out depending on the type of guests that's coming. I know we're running out, we ran out of time, so I cannot keep going, but I'll just uh, barely grow three, through these slides. Uh, some of the roof terraces that, uh, again, begin to organize the spaces around them. What, I, what, we, wanted to, what we wanted to say is that within, within this landscape, uh, the public space, since it doesn't exist or barely exist, people have actually used their private space as a type of public space. And we see that with the current movement right now of the younger generation, they began to occupy the in-between. And they try to create their own public spaces. And that's something which is a sign of relief within these types of societies. Again, I don't want to generalize. This is just a few projects that are of a specific type of people who work, who live in this society. So it's not a generic overview, but it gives you a good background of, of what we deal with in this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to thank uh, Gareth for the invitation and thank the GSD and uh, all the team for inviting me here today. So, um, I just, is this, yes. This. So I'm going to talk about uh, the city of Doha and uh, the themes uh, are going to be waterfronts uh, biodiversity and public art, um, and different types of lights. The waterfront lights uh, are more about layers, lights and layers. Um, when we talk about biodiversity, it's also about levels of darkness and how light pollution can also affect uh, different species. And then public art can be more about uh, ephemeral art or even more dynamic uh, lighting. So uh, why do I talk about uh, blue landscapes? Um, when I arrived in uh, Qatar six years ago, um, it's true everyone was talking about green, green architecture, green uh, be, as being sustainable. And as we know that uh, uh, these uh, countries or these arid landscapes um, have very little water, um, I started to think more about water and uh, to look at, at really water as the essence of, of landscape. And then I also found when I was doing this research a concept by Saatchi and Saatchi. And this concept was also about going from green to blue and going from an anthropocentric approach to a more symbiotic approach. And it was also about not being passive. We talk about passive houses or passive schemes, but also about being more active and that what we do now um, in our designs, in our constructions, actually have to give back more, more resources than we're taking. So I'll start with the, uh, the waterfronts and uh, to talk about the Doha Corniche. So uh, previously, um, my work and research, I've been uh, obsessed with borders for, for many, many years and linear landscapes. And uh, when I arrived in, in Doha, um, I, I started to develop an interest also in the Corniche as a, as a landscape typology. Uh, so here you can see uh, Doha on these, uh, this map of lights. And what was interesting is that in uh, 2000, the Lonely Planet travel book called Doha the dullest place on earth. So since then, obviously, there's been a lot of construction and a lot of lights, and um, I think it's definitely getting, uh, definitely getting brighter. 
So the Corniche, as in many of uh, these uh, Gulf cities, it's uh, the 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 waterfront is is a landfill, a constructed uh, landscape. Um, what I think is really interesting, though, in the Corniche is um, is the form. I think it's quite unusual. Um, it was designed by William Pereira. So this is in, in the uh, 70s and 80s when Doha was developing um, during the, the, the uh, sort of uh, the oil um, development of oil. And I think it is really quite a unique uh, design. As you can see here, this is taken with a fisheye, but it's somehow the city can, can see itself. Most, uh, most uh, landscape, uh, Corniche landscapes are generally of a, of a linear nature. So obviously the waterfront is also the reflection. It's the city that reflects itself in the water. Um, but here we can see we're at the other side of the Corniche, and we can, you know, the city can actually see itself through this semicircular landscape. And these are the, the, um, the uh, landmarks, uh, the Museum of Islamic Art and the Sheraton Hotel, also designed by Pereira, that mark uh, the ends of, these, um, of this semicircular landscape. Um, so why was I interested in, in the Corniche? Um, uh, apart from obviously the formal, um, this sort of spectacular form, um, I'm also interested in the Corniche um, because it's, it's an in inclusive landscape. Yesterday we were talking about you know, whether landscape, landscapes are private. And uh, the Corniche is actually used by all the different uh, cultures and all the different levels of society. During the day, you can see you know, workers resting under the palm trees. Um, as we, we were saying, uh, it is often mostly used in the evening and actually in the morning uh, dawn. There's a lot of people who walk uh, at sunrise um, along the Corniche. It's also what you can call a sort of um, a climatic interface because we know also that the temperature at the Corniche is often uh, much lower than in the rest of the city. So that's why it also attracts people because of the sea breeze and the microclimate. Um, obviously the views um, and also it links uh, a, a series of cultural spaces and also this will be actually uh, developing um, this, this sort of uh, the link between different uh, cultural hubs. So this is a quotation actually from some research that was conducted by some of our students. Um, this, was, this is not research that, uh, that I um, was conducting, but um, it was one of my colleagues. And it was interesting because what they said is that it's dark during the night due to dim lighting, and it raises safety and security concerns for the visitors. Um, from the survey that they conducted, 92% of females feel unsafe walking unaccompanied in the dark. Uh, leading to low utility. Um, so I agree that this is generally the case, and there has been other research by some of our students. In fact, our undergraduate program is, is only for, for females. We have a, a segregated program. Um, and the master's program is a mixed program. But many of the students are interested in these questions. And um, the other student also looked at public parks and women in public parks. And it was uh, one of the, the outcomes was that generally they are not very well lit at night, which is actually quite surprising because that's when, when they would be most used. Um, for the Corniche, I, I'm not sure if it really applies because uh, the Corniche is one of the places where you would see women um, of all, whether it's Qatari women or, or all different, um, you know, you see Filipinos, uh, Europeans, and even women alone walking at night. So I'm not sure if it really does apply to the Corniche. Um, we can see on this picture, it's true that there's there's not a lot of lighting actually on the landscape. Um, there's the lands there's the lighting of the street, um, but not not a lot of lighting on the actual landscape. So here you can see, this is near the West Bay. You have also the incidental lighting from the towers and also the way people use the space. So people bring their own furniture, they bring their own food, etc. There's also installations of different lights during different events. So here you can see some lanterns and uh, different sort of decorative lights. And this is one area where there's a restaurant where they have also um, a, a bit more festive lighting. But uh, generally, uh, the actual walkway is, 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 does not have a lot of public lighting. 
One thing that really contributes as well to the lighting is, is the dows. Um, they have very dynamic lights and, and they're also moving around the corniche. So it's really part of this uh, choreography. Also on National Day, there are certain events where, where um, you, know, you get additional light. This is on uh, the Qatar National Day. Um, so you can see also the cars are, are lit up in all this decorative landscape. And the Corniche is sort of you, at the ceremonial space of Qatar, the heart and the ceremonial space. And also obviously fireworks. Um, this is Diwali, the, the Indian festival of lights. And I will show you um, a short video. Um, if you could please uh, show us the video. Um, the reason is that um, on the one hand, we talk about these layers of light that you can see, and also it's important uh, to see the dynamics of this, uh, of this light landscape. Um, what's interesting is that, uh, that most of it is not really designed. Uh, I mean, the, the, the buildings are designed as light, but there's no light scheme as yet for the Corniche. There is one being developed for the uh, for 2022. As you know, uh, Doha is going to host uh, Qatar is going to host the World Cup. So obviously, there's a lot of projects and work on the on the public realm. Um, but unfortunately, in Qatar, uh, most of the projects are confidential. So um, I couldn't actually, you know, uh, I couldn't see the schemes. But I did talk to the lighting engineers at Arab, um, who say that there will be there is work uh, going on for for the Corniche. So I'm not sure if the video is working. Oh, yes, good, great. So as you can see, the buildings each have their own light and lighting scheme, and many of them have these dynamic schemes. of color how um, the Burj Doha has actually used a color to stand out from all the other uh, buildings. Most of them use blue and green and uh, Jean Nouvel the building uses orange. So this is uh, Sukhwak if we're no longer on the on the Corniche. So here we're coming back to um, to the Corniche and uh, this this choreography, um, which is um, composed of, of the boats uh, and also the buildings and the cars. And um, I think it's a shame as well that that I mean there's a there's a music to this um, this video, but actually what's interesting is also the soundscape because these boats uh, are all playing different kinds of music and, and it also participates in creating not only a lightscape um, but also a very dynamic soundscape. So um, what are the, these layers of light? So as we saw there's the dynamic lights, um, the tower lighting, um, the functional street lights, also the user-generated lights, as we see that um, the, the, this, the practice of this landscape is either people walking or jogging, etc., but also people who come with cars. There's, in fact, a parking all along the Corniche. People park their cars and bring their own tables and chairs, bring their own lights, their own food, etc. Um, so so they, they generate their own light. Um, there's also, obviously, the light of the moon, the stars, etc. So in the discussion with uh, the, the uh, lighting uh, designer, um, they were saying that in the future they were, you know, sort of looking at these layers of light to develop more layers, uh, to create a, a hierarchy, and activating more spaces along the Corniche through light to create the scene of nighttime experiences. Uh, there's also a project of actually continuing this idea of people carrying their own lights. Um, so, th so there's not not only fixed lights, but that you know people have their individual lights. 
So this is also um, from the public realm. Uh, Qatar is also developing a public realm manual, which will include lighting. This is also not yet available. They're developing this with Aircom. But you can see on this light that there, on this uh, slide that there will be more spaces for pedestrian. And you can also see uh, these new lighting fixtures. Yesterday, we were um, talking about public spaces and gentrification. So I would say that um, unfortunately, there is also some gentrification on the Corniche. Um, last year, there was a cafe here and you could buy Carac uh, for two reals, which is maybe 50 cents. Um, so it was a much more accessible um, cafe. Now it's become a Costa cafe. So if you want to buy a bottle of water, you know, it's, it's 15 reals, which is three or four dollars. So, so there is a, a sort of gentrification, which I think is... is um, is not very positive. Um, but on the other hand, the practices, as we've seen, is that people also bring their own, their own food, their own light. Um, so so it's, it's also um, not that important to the use of the Corniche. So in this idea of gentrification, this is the, the Museum of Islamic Art Park, which is opposite um, uh, the Sheraton. And here as well, it is also um, a space where, um, you know, where, which, is, which is quite expensive. So it's not really for... Uh, all, the, all the different uh, users and social um, groups. So um, another thing is, is uh, in the future, you know, what could we, how could we think of this place in the future? So this idea of uh, blue urbanism is also about creating a better interface uh, between the city and the sea. So some of the things that I was looking at is, um, uh, as you know, the word Corniche, it, it's from the French, it really means the edge of the city. So you can see that this edge is a very hard edge in Doha. Um, and you can see some water actually, which is, um, I'm not sure, I think this is it. Uh, the water, which is, this is um, excess wastewater that's going out into the Corniche. Um, and there are several points along the Corniche where this happens. So I think there could be work to do more curating of, this, of these water systems um, and how they're coming from the city into the Corniche. And of course, um, you know, we have to make sure that the water is also um, clean and clean. So we could also use landscapes to additionally clean the water. Um, also, to, to have water fountains, because that's one thing that's missing on the Corniche, is there's no water for people, um, water fountains, uh, access to drinking water. Um, also, more, more consideration for biodiversity and different species uh, that are in the water. And also, maybe creating a more soft edge. We'll see uh, later some projects um, that were designed for the Corniche, which, which have a much softer edge. So this is actually near the Sheraton, where I, where I spend a lot of time. And you can see that there is a lot of urban biodiversity. Um, I've seen quite a few different uh, species there. So, so there is. Um, but as you, you can see, the design here is that there are rocks here. So, so the, the way you design the edge is very important for the species and biodiversity. So I just wanted to show a few projects uh, that have been, uh, because as the, the, the Corniche is a place that, that really invites, uh, invites people to, to design. And this is by Makawa Architects. And uh, this is really underscoring this idea that the Corniche is you know, the heart of the city, the soul of the city. And through a lighting, it's this idea of sort of extruding this arc and uh, underscoring uh, you know, the, the arc through the lighting. Um, this is a model of the project. I'm not sure it's necessary, uh, personally, to, to sort of add a, a kind of monumental lighting, um, but, but I think it's interesting that people want to sort of light up the Corniche. This project was interesting um, because, in fact, they, they, they were inspired by the astrolabs um, that are in the Museum of Islamic Art. And while there's no night scheme, I think it's also in the forms, as you can see, they're sort of you know, these circular forms are sort of multiply this idea of the, of, of, of the astrolabs and, and the sky. So this is a scheme um, also by uh, Can Finch. So you can see this idea of really lighting up the circle and uh, also this um, island in, in the center uh, of the Corniche. And uh, here we can see actually the port, um, that, that Doha's building a new port uh, to the south, and so this is actually going to become a new extension of this landscape um, of the Corniche. This is a scheme by Martha Schwartz. Uh, this was called the White Necklace. Um, and uh, so you can see here the, the night scheme. And so what was interesting in, in her project was 
on the one hand, she creates sort of different layers of landscape, um, and she also creates a new, a new direct, a new axis um, from the city uh, out to the water with this series of um, a series of islands. Here you can see that the conceptual structure. What's also interesting is this idea of a tram line, um, making it more accessible uh, for people without cars. Um, uh, now, actually, Doha is building a metro system. This is going to be one of the legacies of the, the FIFA World Cup. Um, and they, while they've stopped certain projects, um, this has become a priority because for the FIFA and the stadiums, they really do have to develop the public transport. Um, so hopefully there will be a, a better service, uh, that the Corniche will be better served by public transport in the future. So here you can see some details of, of the schemes and uh, the idea that she uses boardwalks, but she's also uh, creating an additional layer uh, to the Corniche, which makes it much more accessible um, for the users. And she's also working here with, with mangroves, um, so sort of creating a mangrove system. This is, this is where the, um, the, the Sheraton is, and this is actually where that, the, the heron um, that we just saw um, was. So creating sort of these new ecosystems. Um, so the lighting is also based um, a lot on her idea of, uh, of the, le the, the necklace, this sort of white necklace, and uh, a central park which is in, in this sort of the axis that is crossing the necklace with a series of, of islands um, that can be accessed by boats. So here you can see an image of this uh, night, night view. So this was another project by Jean Nouvel. This is actually, these was a, a series of project, um, projects for a competition that was held in 2006 on invitation. So I'm not going to show you all of them, but this one was also interesting because it, the main theme of the project was seven lighthouses. So I'm sorry if I'm reading the screen, but uh, I, can, I can't actually see my screen here very well. So I do apologize. <laughs> um, so his idea was... Um, to, to based on seven lighthouses and a co sort of a constellation that he was building in the Corniche. Um, as we know, seven is uh, a, a, a symbolic number in, uh, in Islam and also other cultures. Um, and you can see these uh, seven lighthouses and then he's also constructing um, he's sort of constructing this, uh, this constellation in the Corniche with the lighting. Um, Obviously, there's also a, a series of landscape. These are sort of dunes that he, he brings down to the Corniche. Um, but it's particularly the night landscape um, that, that I was interested in, in looking at. Um, and the way that he's actually sort of curating and, and actually programming um, the water. Uh, so what what's interesting here as well is is his proposal to to actually put the you know the road the Cornish road under underground um that could be discussed because it's obviously a beautiful to you know to drive along the Cornish but for the public spaces it would be it would be very beneficial so he's also creating an additional layer to to the Cornish to make it more accessible to make the water more accessible um, unfortunately, there's no text uh, with this project, so I'm not actually sure about the uses of um, of these lighthouses. Um, from what I can see, is they're more they're more sort of symbolic um, than than actually functional, and there is uh, calligraphy um, on on these lighthouses. So a series of piers. And obviously lighting in the water for the for the piers. And then the constellation, as you can see, it's made by, a, sorry for going so fast, it's made by a series of, of boys. Now, this was another project that, that was interesting because we're talking about biodiversity, um, but this was Stefano Boeri, but he's actually proposing a sort of a biosphere in the center of the Corniche, and this is a view of this biosphere at night. So it's really creating an artificial uh, a biosphere in the middle of the Corniche. So now the Sheraton Park, um, I find this a very interesting project um, because it's, um, it, it's one of the first uh, 
of this type of project in, in Doha, and it's actually um, built on top of a parking. They've created um, a multi-level parking here and then created um, a, a park on top. Um, this reminds me actually in Lyon, uh, in the city of Lyon in the 90s, they, they had a, a, a series of spaces in the city where they took the cars out, they built underground parkings, and they really reclaimed all these public spaces. So here they're really reclaiming um, a public space. And, um, and it has, uh, it's actually a water park. So um, this is, this is a, a feature with uh, music and water, where the water falls on these elements and creates, creates music. Um, there's also a short video here. Um, I have five minutes. OK, so I think we'll skip the video. <laughs> um, because, sorry? Do you, you think we have time? OK. OK, so we'll, we'll watch the video. Um, So the reason it's, it's good to see the video is because actually the, the water and the lighting is, is, is very dynamic. Um. So this was also designed by um, Arab landscapes. And um, what they did is they also minimized the lighting of you know, the trees and the park to sort of enhance the lighting through the water and the fountain. So obviously this park is also used a lot in the, in the early evenings, in the evenings, um, especially during, during the hot weather. It's also an accessible park, so it's accessible to all the the members of society, um, as, as is the Corniche. So it was also designed with international uh, lighting standards and they tried to minimize um, the light pollution. Thank you. So I won't talk about these because we, we saw them in the, um, in the film. So the MIA Park um, is also an extension of, uh, of the Corniche. As you can see, it's sort of a mini Corniche. It was designed also with the museum uh, by IM Pei. And um, it's also um, it's a it's a place also that has quite a lot of programming. There was um, an international food festival last year, um, and there they add a lot of additional lights. But you can see that the landscaping, the lighting is is quite discreet. Um, yet when they have events like here, the food festival, um, you know they add additional lights. You can see these these lights um, fixtures. Um, so, so I think it's it's good that you know there's a minimal lighting and then additional lighting um, when they have uh, when they have programs and events. So this is the cafe. You can see once again that the lighting is is quite minimal. And this is the sculpture by Richard Serra, um, the sculpture called Seven, which is just at the end of of this park. So this is during the uh, food festival. Um, you can see this was you can eat uh, you know have dine in the sky. Um, and this is a future uh, landmark, uh, the flour mills. Currently, there's a competition on the flour mills. So we're actually going to see an extension of these spaces and of these cultural spaces in the Corniche um, uh, in the future. 
So here you can see the uh, location of the flour mills. And also the National Museum of Doha is, is, is just close by, so it's adding to um, these, uh, these cultural spaces. I think this is, this is Santiago Calatrava, who was going to cross the, the Bay of Doha, but from what I hear, this has actually been stopped. And there's also another landscape here, which is a, a, the large central park, which is being designed and built. So that's also going to be very an important sort of connection to the Corniche. I'm going to go very quickly through the Abu Dhabi Corniche. Um, uh, I was in touch with them, and um, as I'm interested in, in Corniches, and, and you know, people said that it was uh, Sheikh Zayed came to Doha and saw the Corniche and said, well, you know, we need the same for Abu Dhabi. Now, I'm not sure if this is true, so I wouldn't want to... Um, <laughs> Um, to uh, say this to our Avi Davi guests, but um, uh, so I think that that generally, whether it's Dubai, Abu Dhabi, all the all the cities are looking to develop uh, the, the Corniche, and um, uh, there was an interesting. Uh, they had a, a lighting plan for the Corniche, which has not been implemented. But the idea was really to find. Uh, to try and create a, a sort of a lighting scheme that would bring together the different elements of the Corniche. This is the breakwater, which is not yet actually built up. Um, and there's a series of public parks, um, and we actually heard about yesterday all sorts of activities going on uh, in the dark. Um, but uh, here, actually, what's interesting in this is, is also looking at different solutions uh, to lighting, and one of them being actually projecting light onto the facades rather than all the buildings fixing their own lights. So it's just looking for different types of solutions. Um, they also want to replace uh, the, the current uh, lighting fixtures just to make them more, the more comfortable for the users. So here we see the Abu Dhabi Corniche, and what's interesting here is that it really has, it has a public beach, and it has an additional layer, as then we can see from the, from the Doha Corniche, um, the, the beach area and uh, the green areas. So Lusail, this is the new city in Doha, and um, it's probably the first city that has a lighting master plan, uh, which is actually available uh, in public. Um, so what's interesting here, probably what I highlight here, I'm not going to go into the whole plan, but it's really looking at uh, different lighting levels, you know, from a magnificent environment to a convivial environment uh, to a discrete environment. Um, and also the different, uh, you know, the public realm, the landmarks, gateways, the waterfront lighting. Here we can see some examples, um, very bright lights. And also the fact that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a smart city. I mean, it is implementing a lot of um, sustainable and smart uh, um, technologies. So obviously the lighting uh, is going to be uh, energy efficient, uh, also using solar power. Um, and they're also looking into this idea of um, switching lights on and off, or there's another concept called dimming, which means you can, you know, change the, the, the intensity of the lights. Um, and as we can see here, the public transport, so this is really going to be new in Lucille, as it's going to be a transit-oriented city. And also um, with um, public spaces and a cycling a path, cycling track. So lighting is also very important for the cycling. So there's also a waterfront scheme um, that's being developed for Lucille. Um, apparently, that from what I heard from the, the, the people who were designing it, they said not all of this will be uh, implemented, but the, the idea is having a, a light fixture, as you can see here, which, has, which lights the street, um, but also there's a part of it which is for the, you know, the, the sort of the night show lighting. So now I want to talk uh, very quickly about biodiversity. And... Um, I was uh, very, um, uh, very blessed to, to accompany the uh, Qatar University uh, Association, uh, Astronomers Association. Um, and uh, so what was interesting is uh, I discovered actually this site called Dark Sky Association, which is really looking at light pollution and how it affects wildlife ecosystems, uh, etc. cetera. And, um, so they look at all these, um, they have all these different programs related to this. And uh, so I asked the, the students, you know, how do they choose the sites um, where they go to in Qatar? Because obviously they're looking for the darkest places in Qatar. So this is a, a map of light pollution 
in the Gulf, and this is one in uh, this is Qatar. So. Um, so this is, uh, this is actually the area we went to last time. You can see, so these are the, the, the dark areas. So these are good for astronomy. But this is, you can see the difference here between, uh, this is a difference uh, of, I'm trying to go backwards, um, uh, five years. So you can see that the light pollution has increased greatly. So this is the area. So you can see there's, you know, not much, uh, there's only some electricity uh, poles in the distance, but there is not much lighting. And, um, you know, we use obviously very little light, um, you know, to get better images of the sky. So this is one of the, I just show you a few beautiful pictures from one of the students um, of the night sky. So this is also, here we can see the, the galaxy, the Milky Way, um, some of the photos that were taken in the dark spots of uh, Qatar and the meteoroid shower. So another project I'm working on with my students is turtle conservation. Um, and uh, we did this project uh, on a beach in Qatar. So why a turtle is important? The hawksback bill turtles are actually one of the, the, the most endangered species of turtles. There are seven different species. And um, they nest in, in several beaches in Qatar. And they're also actually, uh, turtles are, um, uh, they indicate the health of the oceans and they also clean the coral reefs. Uh, so they have a very uh, important ecological function. So these are some of the areas where the hawksbill turtles are found. So this is a field trip um, with our students to the beach. And um, so we've been working at different levels with the students, um, designing pavilions for turtle conservation to raise awareness, because actually most of my students had never heard of hawksbill turtles. Everybody knows the oryx and you know these other species, but nobody knows the species in the sea. Um, and with the master students, we actually worked on developing a master plan. And our idea is to make this into an eco beach and to, you know, get rid of all the cars because the cars are also compacting the sand. Um, so every year it's harder and harder for the mother turtles to to be able to dig their nests. Um, this is the light pollution from this beach, um, and this is Ras Lafan. So this is the oil, uh, you know, oil and gas re refinery. And this is what they see: the baby turtles. The problem with lighting is that when the when the babies hatch, they're attracted to the glimmering of the ocean. But when they see lights, they think it's the ocean, so they go towards the land, and then and then they die. Um, so that's why it's really important. Um, so this is just some light pollution uh, along these nesting beaches. Um, as you can see, these these very bright lights. So when this is uh, an example, actually, of poaching, there's still uh, poaching going on of of the eggs. Um, and as you can see, we work. I'm sorry, we work just with uh, with headlights, and usually with infrared lights. We use the white lights just for photography, but um, the red light is used um, so it doesn't uh, disturb the turtles. So uh, there's a special way that we need to design um, the areas which are. Um, on the, the nesting uh, sites. Uh, so we looked at this with our students um, so that we could propose um, a sort of better lighting for these areas. Um, so there's also solar, obviously solar technologies uh, for this. So I won't go into the details, but it's just you know to show that um, it's really important to think about um, the shoreline um, lighting. And I think in Florida, they're actually leading these efforts because they've, they've done surveys of kilometers of shoreline to survey the lighting um, and the effects that it has on biodiversity. So these were sort of the developing this master plan for the eco beach um, in, in Qatar. So in Sadiat, they also have one. There's a, there's a five-star hotel. I stayed there once, uh, I think the St. Regis, and they actually have, uh, at night, they, have, uh, they, they take all the lights off at the beach, and you're not allowed to use lights because they also have a nesting beach there. So um, increasingly, um, uh, you know, people are being aware of this and, and um, using the appropriate lighting. So it's this idea of biodiversity, you know, that, that we're all in this together. It's, you know, beyond, as I said, in blue, beyond the Anthropocene. So... Um, just to finish off, I'll talk a little bit about public art, because this is something new in Doha. These are the old public art sculptures, the very traditional elements. Um, and we also have some new sculptures. This one is, is uh, calligraphy, um, but this is one by Damien Hurst. And uh, so there is also lighting that has to be developed for these uh, sculptures. Uh, now, this public art, though, is, is also very controversial. And um, so most of the time, actually, these, these uh, sculptures are, are actually um, wrapped up. As you can see here, it looks a little bit like a, a Christo installation. Um, and we had some interesting discussions with our students because um, 
um, you know, there's a cultural issue. Is, is, is it representing, you know, a person? Because it's, it's called the miracle of life, and it's the nine months and stages of development of a fetus. And so it's not yet really a person. And, you know, and for some people, it is... Uh, culturally, there is an issue. So a lot of this public art is raising discussions, which I think is, is, is a good thing. Um, um, but as you can see, sometimes, you know, the sculptures are, are exposed and sometimes, sometimes they're veiled, but they definitely need to be lit up. So this is another beautiful sculpture we have by Richard Serra, which has absolutely no lighting, uh, thank God. Um, and uh, it's in Zikrit, in a, in a very dark area. Um, but it, it attracts people like uh, this Richard Bentley um, to do light art. So this is a new light painting um, where people look for dark areas. This is a calligrapher who also does calligraphy. He has to actually do the calligraphy backwards, you know, so that it's, it, it's read in the right way. Um, so these are people who are also looking for the dark areas. Um, this is just... Uh, also, the Blue Nights, this is how you have a global movement of lighting to raise awareness, awareness on autism. You know, so this is a sort of ephemeral event um, for raising awareness on, on, um, on the autism. And Doha participated in it uh, in the last couple of years. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk about Festival of Lights. This is a festival in Sharjah, which I, I've only just discovered now. Um, but it's interesting because it can be a way to experiment as well with, uh, with light. And um, it reminds me, in fact, uh, that uh, many years ago, actually in 2000, uh, I have to stop. Yes, OK. So um, I'll just wrap up. So I used to, I did work um, on the Fête de Lumière, um, and I brought the lighting artist to Geneva. And this was my Plan Lumière for the city of Geneva. Um, and uh, it was actually a way to experiment in public space because we were able to close, to take you know, cars off the streets, um, create lighting. And it's also a moment where all the buildings, the opera, they were all open to all parts of society. Um, this is the Berlin Wall commemoration through light. Um, and um, my proposal was also this idea of using light you know, to create a river of memory. So I'm also interested in sort of looking at philosophy and uh, Ibn Arabi and looking at light um, in a more sort of philosophical way and how we could actually look and uh, bring these, this way of thinking and, uh, into the landscape and maybe finding that balance between the light and the dark so that, you know, that the light will shine more brilliantly, which means it's not that there's more light, but it just shines better and more brilliantly. And just an homage to, sorry, um, this light night came from a friend of mine who just passed away last year. She's a, a filmmaker from Geneva. And so I borrowed the title from her. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, or afternoon now. Uh, thank you for having me. Today, um, I will be talking about the changing nocturnal landscapes and public spaces in the United Arab Emirates, uh, with specific examples from the Emirates of Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Um, I will be introducing three variables that shape them. These variables are climate, culture, and consumerism. Al-Jahli Park in Al-Ain will be the centerpiece of this talk, but it will not be the only example I'll be sharing with you today. Established in 1971, the United Arab Emirates is a federation of seven emirates, so the emirates of Abu Dhabi and Dubai are just two of the seven. It is situated at the Strait of Hormuz, um, sharing the borders with the neighboring countries of Amman and Saudi Arabia. The Emirate of Abu Dhabi is the federal government seat of the UAE. Um, it is the largest emirate uh, in total land area, as you can see. And it is the wealthiest uh, with majority of the country's hydrocarbon reserves. The Emirate of Abu Dhabi consists of three municipal regions. Uh, Abu Dhabi, which is shown um, in dark gray at the center. Uh, it is the capital of the UAE. Um, Al Ain region, which is where our tale begins, um, is, uh, lies east of the capital, uh, and it is shown in uh, orange, um, and Al Dhafra region that, that lies west uh, of the capital. Al Ain city, my hometown, um, uh, which in Arabic means the spring, 
is uh, the urban center of the Al Ain region. It is not a new city. In fact, for centuries, uh, human civilization existed in the area where our ancestors built uh, forts and oases that are now considered UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Nevertheless, a satellite image taken late in the 20th century still showed Al Ain city with nothing but um, the natural desert landscape, um, except for the tribal settlements clustered around the oases. With a climate that can reach an average, uh, the worst uh, times of the year, an average of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the oases became the defining public space of the, of the region. Uh, the humidity levels in Abu Dhabi get so unbearable, so residents from the capital actually cross miles of desert to be sheltered in Al Ain, and they usually come um, in, in the oases. Uh, this obviously happens during the gale, uh, gale season um, or the summer season. So residents um, of Al Ain actually has the oases as their backyard, as I mentioned earlier. These, the, these tribal settlements are clustered around the oases. Um, so they would seek the oases on different times of the day uh, to escape the heat, um, only to abandon it at night because the temperatures cool down. So in this snapshot of the city, the oases were both shelter and public space. That was way before ACs were introduced. The city only, s and, and the, the defining variable is climate. Um, the city only started to urbanize after the vision of one man and the discovery of oil. Um, this is the late Sheikh Zayed, the man sat at the center of this photograph. Uh, and uh, he was an Al Ain native himself. He became ruler of Abu Dhabi in 1967 and later to become the first president of the UAE in 1971. And he believed that water is as much the driver to civilization as oil revenues is to urbanization. So, even after foreign agricultural experts came, uh, came in and ruled the land as infertile, Sheikh Zayed's legacy became the man who successfully transformed this barren desert into a green haven. Today, more than 70 public parks and gardens adorn the city of Al Ain. So the function of shelter and public space that were present in one, in one space, and that is the oasis, um, in this um, snapshot of the city it was, is actually split into two. ACs were introduced, so residents um, or visitors of the park actually were sheltered in their homes and the privacy of their homes during the day. So the defining public space of the city became um, public parks. And residents would commute by car to district level parks. Um, to take children out to play, to socialize, um, and even exercise. So the variable that is climate is still constant. Um, and naturally, these resi the residents would go to parks um, from hours close to sunset and stay there until after dark. But unlike the true definition of public open space, public parks in Al Ain started off as gated. Named after the district it was established in, Al Jahli Park uh, sits uh, right in the heart of the city, uh, adjacent to Al Ain Oasis, which is the largest of the six um, in the city. Uh, so it is where diversity and density resides. The park historically had two sections. So one that is open and um, one that is fenced, which is shown in um, the orange borders. So although the gated park had an entry fee, it was a more popular destination for families and for women um, on certain days to go to. The fences really reflected elements of the traditional homes in the region where um, it ensured uh, separate male and female social spaces. So it means that women don't have to cover uh, when they um, socialize. So the fences really cater to the culture of comfort and privacy uh, so this allowed women to take their children out um, uh, from the comfort and the privacy of their homes to linger in safely in public parks um, until quite late at night. In the turn of the 21st uh, century, the municipality decided to, um, to uh, approach uh, public spaces differently. Um, so they actually redeveloped the city parks by taking down the fences. Al-Jahli Park became the first true public open space um, in the city. 
and several parks uh, followed. Um, however, the number of visitors uh, to public parks declined ever since. Um, one can say that it's because of the element um, of privacy and comfort that is missing, but um, I can assure you um, it is because uh, the nocturnal visitors found um, a different environment to exist in. So during the same time, uh, private developers introduced shopping malls uh, to the city. El Ain had its first shopping mall in 2001. And shopping malls uh, sort of mimicked the function of the oases by providing that, that um, cooler environment. So you will see visitors, or maybe we should call them consumers now, roaming in the indoor spaces of shopping malls um, throughout the day. But shopping malls in Al Ain also reflected the cultural norms and needs. Uh, so in addition to providing uh, leasable retail spaces, shopping malls also provided, uh, provided prayer rooms, neighborhood supermarkets, and children play areas, or what I call them on-call nurseries, so women would actually drop their kids um, in the children play area and go and, and uh, socialize with their friends and members of their family. So, but most importantly, what shopping malls um, bred was the culture of consumerism. And apparently, there's no turning back. Um, meanwhile, Al Jahli Park stood there fenceless. Uh, but it still had visitors, except they were exclusive to a certain income band and, well, gender, labor workers. So the municipality wanted to attract the old visitors, park, um, old visitors back to the park, and they sure borrowed a solution from where these consumers uh, lingered the most, shopping malls. Today, Al Jahli Park is a popular destination, even throughout the day, but the traffic that you will encounter is not foot traffic, it's actually cars lined up at the edge of the park, um, waiting for their turn at the Starbucks drive through Maybe it was the coffee or maybe it was the culture shift, um, but uh, somehow Al Jahili Park became an inclusive space now where individuals and families um, are um, hanging out in. So within so within um, a matter of decades, we've witnessed the culture of privacy and comfort slowly di dying and the culture of consumerism um, arising. And actually the success of Al Jahli Park's drive through propelled the municipality to look at public parks as potential spaces for investment. Umm Al Imarat Park is another example. Uh, just like Al Jahli Park in Al Ain, Umm Al Imarat Park is uh, situated at the heart of Abu Dhabi Island. It was once called um, Al Mushraf Central Park. So recently it was um, revitalized and rebranded. Uh, re However, the fences are still up. Uh, but if you go to the park um, at the evening, you will find more than just uh, women and families there. Uh, the park successfully attracted uh, crowds of millennials. And you can see from this photograph, they're mostly Emirati that make up 20% of the population in Abu Dhabi. But this is thanks to a locally established urban food businesses and seasonal food festivals. The park operates between the hours of 8 to 12 a.m., but you'll only see visitors um, going to the park between the hours uh, close to sunset, uh, between 4 to, to 10 p.m. But um, you will find, and I'm, one of, um, I'm guilty of that, you will still see visitors going to the park in what is considered odd hours. Um, I guess it's as early as um, the idea of burger and cheese fries is accepted as an early meal. But overall, what you can say is the Emirate of Abu Dhabi is looking at, um, is rebranding public parks by bringing in that retail experience. Meanwhile, 100 miles north of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, Dubai is working on a different experiment. For a city that is run on real estate and tourism, Dubai managed to build approximately 70 shopping malls in a span of two decades. Uh, it's a, approximately the same number as um, public parks in Al Ain. 
But these malls are generally traditional inward looking spaces and developers are constantly competing to be the center of attraction. So most recently, they have experimented by merging the indoor and the outdoor experience. CityWalk is a famous uh, example um, uh, and a, a recent addition to this phenomenon. It is part of a mixed use uh, development, but this mall right here has parts that are exposed to the elements such as this promenade and um, the mall mostly is uh, contained beneath a glass roof that gives the visitors or the consumers the the, the sense of being outside, outside while enjoying the benefits of being inside. However, if you take, that, take away this microclimate, um, this is Box Park, uh, I think it is similar to London's Box Park. It's a, bo a pop-up mall and it doesn't have a roof over its development. It literally spills the shopping um, and dining experience in the street of Dubai or more like the one street, uh, Al Wasl Street in Dubai. But as you can see uh, from this image, um, this was taken in a rainy day um, uh, around 3 p.m. Um, but the traffic, the sidewalk doesn't match the vehicular traffic uh, the development is along. However, these spaces, um, if we would compare it to the public parks of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, are not necessarily inclusive. I guess um, going back to the three C's, uh, climate, culture, and consumerism, these may not be the only remedies that shape the future of UAE's public spaces. Um, but we've seen how, because of the climate, the earliest form of public space in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi were the oases that provided a cooler environment for residents to use during the day. And in the span of decades, the transformation of public spaces went from public gated parks that cater to the culture of privacy and comfort, um, and, and later um, these gates were gone. Um, and we've seen how these uh, nocturnal visitors fled to indoor spaces of shopping complexes that fed to the culture of consumerism. And more recently, the Emirates of Abu Dhabi and Dubai are experimenting by merging these two experiences. However, one is more park and the other is more shopping complex. One can potentially be more inclusive, the other is exclusive to consumers. Um, and one is limited to after dark use and the other promises at least 12 hours of lingering time. So I guess my question is, how do we ensure the perfect balance? Although the successful shape and form of UAE's contemporary public spaces is not certain, but I can tell you for now that only time and the weather can tell. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your brilliant presentations. We've been I'm dizzy of getting so many planes moving to different places, and it's been very nice. We've been looking at different topics, different scales, and it will uh, it will be. I hope we can kind of bring it together and, and get to some conclusions. Um, I haven't been in the area that much. I was only working on a research project in Bahrain, and I was traveling there in the year 2014, and I always thought that Spain was very hot in the summer until I got there. So it was very, very, very intense experience, and even if I thought again that I was prepared for the heat, I, it wasn't. It wasn't the case. It was very, very kind of a very deep experience. And it really made an impact on me the way you know, the day cycle operates, you've been mentioning how different and how climate really rules how people live and move. And it was very surprising to see that actually, even if there is these new master plans and they're kind of um, making the city much larger and everything else, still the, the areas that are more public, more popular and more used are, is, are concentrated in the historical center. So the historical center of Muharraq was very comfortable I mean, you know, relatively comfortable in terms of climate, and it was very active, especially in the evenings, as you were mentioning. But the new areas were very much designed for car use, 
for car scale and the, for the car speed. So there was no any consideration about the human scale. So it was very surprising to see that the sun was like that. And actually the public spaces were completely empty, completely dry, completely impermeable. So it was very, very surprising to see that the, the city was growing in such a way that it was promoting a very artificial atmosphere kind of living. So, you know, I kind of thought that people were just in their air-conditioned home, driving in their air-conditioned car to their air-conditioned uh, office, and then to the shopping mall, and then to the whatever the cycle was. So it was very, I really thought, okay, what is the, what is the meaning of the public space here anymore? How can we designers actually drive a change? How can we incorporate some other kind of features to make it really human again? And um, yes, and we've been seeing different kind of uh, pieces out of this. I enjoyed very much the first presentation, which was very architectural, but very, but it has so much of this already because it really talks about the life cycle, about how public the private home becomes, and and especially it makes even more sense when these public spaces are dysfunctional, or or they're very kind of uh, or not that inclusive. So I really understand the very very you know public role of the of the home as a, as a gathering place. Of course, there were luxury homes, which you know makes it even easier, but it was very, very nice to see also the interplay between the indoor and the outdoor, and how through the filtering of layers and how through the incorporation of vegetation, you can actually recreate this kind of natural experience, even if we are in a home. I enjoyed the second presentation and the idea of power. I, I, you know, power, like the power of the power, right? And the power of the infrastructure. And you mentioned at some point that actually together with the electricity, it was the air conditioning. So I'm very intrigued about how, again, this has shaped not only the indoor living, but actually the outdoor living and how much people are so used to the climatic or the control atmospheres and whether they are eager to be exposed at all. I enjoyed also your presentation and I, I very much enjoyed the turtle project and I really, you know, like this care for, and you know, this kind of um, yeah, care and time at looking at what's happening and how, and how through design we can actually protect or, or create the best kind of possible uh, uh, habitat for these um, uh, animals. I was wondering, you know, it was very, it was a very contrasting uh, presentation because we had this kind of very careful, you know, experience compared to this kind of urban atmospheres that is very much like kind of a spectacle. Like it really shows that the different cities are competing between each other. So the light became so overwhelming that I, I kind of miss the human experience again, the kind of the ground level experience. So it was very much about the spectacle and the show of the lighting. And then I enjoyed, of course, the idea of the public spaces and the public parks becoming, or, or you know, it was very, yeah, it's, it's tricky to see that they're shifting towards a kind of a retail experience, but I like the idea, of course, of, of, of nature embedded into the city to actually provide a social opportunity. So, which I think, again, is related not only to the social aspect, but also to the climatic comfort. So after this, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> but I can start. So, well, the first question will be related to the, to the role of designers and how much we can actually intervene in this kind of cultural shift. Because as I said, or you know, as I saw it, um, public space is very, it's kind of in danger somehow because of the, because of also the distances that, you know, uh, the, the city is planned so that you can actually, you have to move by car and, and also, you know, I see the role of the public space as the kind of the, the most democratic space in such a way that is very inclusive or should be inclusive. And any other kind of a space, you know, the shopping mall as an oasis, that was kind of a dangerous thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of a scary because it's very, very little inclusive. So I just wonder how through design we can embed a more kind of um, comfortable human scale into the public spaces. So from your experience or from your academic experience, I don't know. If you want um, to well, I think um, I'm not here representing the Abu Dhabi Urban Planning Council, but I can tell you uh, what they're working on. Um, and I don't know if you can hear me. I think I should get closer. Istidama is one of the, the things that they're working. It's, it's just it's equivalent to lead. Um, and they were, what they're looking at is there's specific um, standards to public open spaces. And one of them ensures um, Providing that microclimate through minimum, like sh providing shade, um, we planners we find it um, sometimes um, 
very hard to, to, to provide, like 70% of public open spaces should be shaded. Um, and it is, I think, it will be a challenge for designers. Um, but the, like the oases, we can't change the climate. It's, it's very hot and you've experienced that. But if you provided the shade, there's the breeze that, that gives you that um, sense uh, of being comfortable in, mm -hmm. out, outside in that uh, climate. So this is um, from the government's aspect. Um, they've developed these manuals um, and Istidama is one of the, the programs that will help ensure these public spaces can be used throughout the day and not just after dark. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, another interesting idea, I think is um, this idea of buffer or, or you know, the kind of the filter between the private and the public and whether this could play a role not only in terms of public-private but also in terms of climatic. So uh, in your case, uh, that you've been operating in this kind of architectural pieces that, you know, there are, there are dealing with the public-private also within the very architecture because you were talking about the men's a bathroom or, or room or working room. So there is different kind of, it's a kind of a little ecosystem. You know, the family really operates a kind of a societal level. So I, I just wonder how much you've learned or how much you've experienced about this kind of filtering and how to create this kind of different degrees of privacy uh, through architectural materialities. For, I mean, for us, we, we have been discussing these issues for a very long time, I think, since we started practicing, because we realized that, okay, nowadays it's already difficult to, to talk about public and private spaces, but especially in, in this part of the world, I mean, there's a, a kind of a transfer, a direct transfer between what is the public and, and, and the private, uh, to an extent in which even uh, uh, no, the, the coast, for instance, uh, the last example that we just, uh, on the last project we just show, you know, the, the, the part in front of your house, you take over you know, as part of you, which is public land. So what, and, and then you have the contrary, something that is, is private, it's the, there's so many social interactions happening at the same time, and that such a, a different levels that makes it more public than the street by itself. So for us, it's very difficult always you know, to, to do this split between public and, and, and private. And it's true that uh, architecturally, what helps us is to, to accommodate these, these transitions. You know? uh, what now suggests that part of the... For us, the, the houses is still right now, how we see it, at the, the core of these public spaces. Uh, I mean, it's where most of the social activity, not because, uh, I mean, the house is, has a tradition, but because most of the, the public, uh, the social activities are happening inwards, no? Which at the same time, uh, it's, it's very ex extroverted because it's also where the, they, they unveil, women, for instance, they unveil themselves, is also where the, the owners, you know, they have higher interaction uh, on the virtual world. So in one way, it's, it's, yeah, you are in your private home, but at the same time, where you have higher exposure to, to other worlds or even to, to your, your colleagues, no? So I, th I think if, if you look at it from what is considered to be social norms, and I'm I cannot generalize this to the, all of the Gulf, but specifically in Kuwait, social norms, issues related to privacy, issues related to I'm, I'm introverted, although maybe in, in, uh, in using social media I am an extroverted, but within my real life I am an introverted. So since I am introverted, how do I define my public life? And that public life begins to, of course, naturally uh, change the way we live in any social settings. So that duality is very unique to a society where it is very much uh, introverted when it comes to the way they like to live. And uh, I think when, this is why when we, when we looked at it and we tried to frame it in addressing the home, within a home you choose to invite the people in, you choose to uh, pretend or even act in particular ways that you choose uh, to do which is very unique to uh, each of these projects and actually each of these families. And uh, that is something you cannot do in the street or in the mall. And, and it, it's funny enough if you begin to observe people in public spaces, primarily in malls, 
they act completely differently than they act in their homes, and as if they're two different people. Mm -hmm. And I think the minute we begin to change that social norms, I think the public life will begin to be explored on more evenly uh, within the society. Another question related to the to Doha and Anna's presentation. You were talking about this blue landscape and how much you you know for for a number of years it was green, 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 and now you kind of focus or or, or you were interested in the blue. It was very in interesting this idea of renaturalization, although the limit you know is so artificial and so much concrete and so little natural. So I just wonder how you feel about that or how do you think such a kind of an artificial again you know uh, imposition can really be, does any, any kind of chance of becoming more renaturalized and therefore, I think, connected to kind of human scale? You were showing some examples from different projects. Yes. Um, uh, yes, I think, I think the interface is really important. And, and as I've been observing, there is, um, I think, urban biodiversity is, is important because as we see, I mean, Qatar is, is basically urban, most of it. Um, you know, there are a few beaches that, that we're trying to save. But... Um, so I think it's really important to think of urban biodiversity, and I think uh, I think the way we design the edges is important. I think um, some of the examples I showed, um, uh, the Martha Schwartz project, or even actually just looking at the Corniche in Abu Dhabi, the way it's been designed, um, it, it really has a softer edge. Um, and um, so I think there is there is a possibility to sort of uh, you know redesign that layer to make it a more e sort of ecological interface i mean i don't have the, the answers but i think um, i think it's something that that we should be looking at and also as i mentioned you know we have the, looking at the water systems and how the water from the city is interfacing with the water from the corniche and how we can curate that but also use it in the landscape i think we really need that you know to look at the city as a system and to look at the urban biodiversity mm -hmm. and to sort of redesign the 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 corniche i think it's actually um, because also when you look at the Corniche, um, the, the actual public space is very, very narrow. Uh, I didn't really maybe show enough plans um, because, I mean, it's the first time I'm really looking at the, the lighting aspect, so, so this is sort of a, a work in progress. And you mentioned that, that I did show a lot of spectacle. And I think actually the next thing to show would be actually to go and, uh, you know, document people using the space um, and how they use the space. And I don't think... Uh, I think there should be a sort of more ecological interface. On the other hand, I don't think over-programming or over-lighting is either a solution. I think, I think it's really that finding that balance because, as we saw yesterday, or you know, we we need also the dark um, for different reasons, whether it's for biodiversity or just for privacy. So, so I think we have to be careful with over-programming as well. And um, and I think uh, you know, showing and and observing how people use and bring also their own, uh, you know, I think there's something more ecological about people bringing their own things. And it's, it's sort of that nomadic tradition a lot of people have in their car, you know, a little set to make their own tea and, you know, a light and a lantern. And, and so I, I think, I think it's, it's nice to sort of encourage that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, actually connected to that comment, <clears throat> I would like to say that it was very relevant that every project that you show of the Corniche was extremely light. And there was a lot of light, there was a lot of spectacle. Even the Jean Nouvel project of these seven lighthouses, I was wondering whether they could be visible or not because there's already so much happening. And also I was, I was a bit uh, impressed by the fact that, that many of the public space uh, pictures that you show were empty, there was no people there. So I was just wondering, you know, whether that is kind of a follow-up of how these public spaces of large scale with so much water and you know so much happening and with this kind of overwhelming background they're very active they're very active between what times or or they're just too big and probably people gather in some other space, spaces um yes maybe i do need to document um better as i said this is this part of the work the night work is 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 new for me um but uh, the corniche is definitely um actually the water park is is new um okay. so the pictures uh the, the video had you know there are not many people but if if you if i'd um been able to take pictures last week um they had a food festival there and it was just you know full of people and um um, so, so it's true that some of the images I have are not, you know, are not the right images. Um, mm -hmm. The Corniche, though, is if you go in the morning, as I said, at dawn, or in the evenings, um, it is it's it's very very much used. Um, as you said, maybe in the during the daytime in the summer, 
you know, you won't see you won't see many people. But during the winter and at those times, you know, the, the spaces are used. The Museum of Islamic Art Park as well um, is is also very very much uh, used. So so you're right. I think I think you know maybe the documentation is is um, is not. Uh, doing homage to these spaces because I think they, the, the Corniche and the adjoining spaces are are functioning well and are, are mostly uh, quite inclusive, you know, as compared to other spaces in Doha. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to pass the microphone. I don't know if there is any questions in the room. Um, yeah, I have, it's actually a comment and question, and it's um, for Nasser and Joaquin about from the projects that you were um, presenting. And I actually I had a couple of comments or concerns. One was actually, before I get to the talk, Nasser, you had just mentioned during your comments that, you know, that society in Kuwait is introverted in the way that they like to live. And I think that is also something that I think we need to unpack a little bit more. Um, in that it's not a culturally determined reality that people live more insular or more introvertedly in Kuwait. It's an outcome of how the city was developed after the oil, the effect of suburbanization, the privatization of public space after oil, not only by the state, but also by a lot of the very elite rich families through things like land grabbing, including in areas like Mesila, which, um, which was where some of your projects were. So I think it, we have to be wary of you know, looking at this as an introvert and how people live privately as an outcome of different planning and, and effects like that. But to go to the talk itself, you mentioned right at the end that this is an examples of how people in Kuwait are creating their own public spaces within their homes. I would be really, really, really hesitant to use the board public spaces here. You know, these are extremely privatized spaces and homes, even the way you showed, even these neighborhoods in which they are uh, located are very, very elite, highly privatized um, areas. But I understand what you're saying. You know, they're creating spaces to compensate for the absence of spa public spaces of social interaction and exchange and are therefore creating these kinds of spaces within their own homes to satisfy their own social needs and desires that they're not getting outside the house. But again, I think it's just important to point out that these are very, very, very much a minority elite who have the resources and the space to be able to create these kinds of of places, and so, and I know here you are presenting your own particular projects. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I can push you as architects to think a bit also more broadly in Kuwait. Um, you know, to satisfying the demands of these very minority clients to design their houses for you know home entertaining that that that, that they're very atypical for the majority of the population of Kuwait who don't have the space or resources to create these and are still dealing with the lack of places of social exchange and interaction outside. So I'm just wondering here, you know, to what extent as architects and especially as local architects designing for local needs to be designing um, pr primarily to sort of um, accommodate the, these private elite desires, but then also to be thinking about the rest of the population, the majority of the population. Um, so thinking in terms of designing also more publicly the same kinds of, to, to satisfy the same kind of desire for social interaction, spaces of social interaction and exchange, but outside the realm of this very, very elite landscape um, where, where these kinds of spaces can be created, but again, very private. It struck me as interesting to see that the house in Mesila, was that on the beach or on the sea, but had a sea view, okay. Yeah. Um, and then, but it's very, very insular. Then Benedir, the house on the seafront is very sort of connected to the outside, to the space, but just as you were saying, that's because the public space of the beach is turned into private, so the house can be more outward looking. So I just wanted to raise those concerns or issues to you. If, if may I answer the questions, this is one of the things, we don't like to talk about public and private spaces, especially in Kuwait, no? Because for us, it's what I was mentioned before, it's very difficult to say what is public, what is private. You say, yeah, this is an elite, and it's true. I mean, we are showing extreme conditions, but it's true that many other people that cannot access these luxurious houses, also, they, they have their own social activities related to the living spaces. And one way or another one, it could be on a corner on the street, on a setback, things. So that's, uh, for us, that is the, the reality. Why? Because it's the reaction on, on, a, 
on what we call a social space that is not existent. The same that for us, uh, Shahid Park or the avenues, okay, you could call them social spaces, but they are so much artificial that, uh, and it's what we mentioned before, they are politically controlling one way or another one. And it's true that right now what we see is that there is a reaction, especially from the millennials uh, or young people, or young, younger than us, we are young, but uh, younger, <laughs> uh, especially in Kuwait, that they are pushing to take over uh, leftover spaces of the city, and they are really doing a very good job. And it's very interesting, that process. Uh, where are we standing? Okay, at the end, we have to service our clients as practitioners, uh, but we are very much interested in these dynamics. And the, the question that uh, Belinda was saying before, I think us as practitioners, we have to be aware of what the society is, you know, the, is, is going. You know? It's true there are some taboos, or, uh, but at the same time, you see there's a draft, you know, there's a, it's a strong change in, in the society that we are seeing. Just, just Farah, to, to complement that. Uh, yes, the projects we actually were very much showing are uh, for a particular section of or sliver within the society. But if you look at actually the desert camps, which is the, the opposite, although that does the same thing. You could go set a tent, you pay no fees to, bear, to do that. And within that, you create your own environment, which is very similar. You invite specific people to enter, so it's a public desert and then you create your private life within that. So yes, the society is definitely not fully introverted, but actually due to privacy reasons, due to social limited interaction, we want to, or we believe that the society is very much close, closed in. Uh, although when they are in the public spaces, and, and we all know that, they act completely differently. And I think that interaction between how people are indoors versus outdoors, okay, if I don't want to say public or private, makes a very interesting distinction. I think we don't only design public, uh, private houses. We actually, we, we work on, on yeah. various types and of I, projects. And I think this is gonna be also the next step for Kuwait, you know? I mean, how these big developments, how this, uh, okay, from a, a type of city, you know, a low density city into a more dense city with uh, uh, high rise developments, how we, we could provide you know, that interaction spaces that would be, have different layers of, of control, control meaning by their own users, not by uh, external powers. You know? And I think that's also the, the interest, of, for instance, in, in our practice. You know? I think that was sort of what I was alluding to or pushing towards is that as practitioners and as private you know, practitioners um, and architects working in a society like in Kuwait, where there is a growing realization of the need for more public spaces of interaction. Um, you know, is there room to be able to move outside of the private world of these, you know, elite houses and building these spaces to moving more towards that public realm? And what is, and I think this sort of leads to the question Uyam was asking me yesterday, I know you guys weren't there yesterday, but what then can be the role of the practitioner in, in developing these kinds of more public kinds of uh, places? I think oh, we believe there are always opportunities, no? Uh, we, are, we are right now building a, okay, a very big development in which the, the emergency sisters uh, we are using as a, 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 they became a platform of connectivity for the whole complex. So these sort of elements, the, I mean, we have to, as a practitioners, have to be a, a bit aware you know, and, and imaginative to, to, to deliver this type of spaces that in most cases, uh, even neither the client nor the end users, they, they, they realize you know, that they are there right now during the design process. They will realize, and hopefully later on, uh, this is what we are trying as practitioners, provide them these spaces for them to take over. Hi, good morning. Uh, the, the question I had uh, deals with the concerns of practitioners, uh, public safety and lighting, that kind of thing. Um, how to balance that with um, other um, means of perception, like the smell of the sea or smoke in a hookah cafe or the other things that we sense around us in a, when the lighting is not, does not permit a good sight. Could you 
could you imagine as practitioners or your observations in the field how some of those things can be reconciled? Sure, if I really yeah. understand the question. Uh, so, you know, our codes require things as uh, so many lumens per square foot, et cetera, et cetera. So we have very prescriptive codes. But before all that took place, I can imagine that we're creative people. We can find ways to uh, design spaces that respond to, uh, you mentioned a comment about um, women feeling insecure in the Corniche, for example, you know, responding to those kind of concerns all through other means of perception or signaling or <coughs> things like this. Have, can any of you comment on that? Well, maybe I can try, but I think it's, I think it's a good question and, and I, I don't think I have the answer. I think that having done this, this work and, and this research, which I've just started to do, um, I think it's, it's a very important question, is to find that balance. And, you know, at the end, I sort of use this concept of, of brilliance is, is, you know, that, that is not just light, but, but, you know, just enhancing all our senses as well. Because when there's too much light, then, you know, we don't maybe feel or hear or et cetera. And I think a lot of this, as you're talking about, it's, you know, the based on fear, you know, and, you know, that we're afraid and et cetera. And so, so I think that it is, it is a challenge, you know, and, and we, have to, we have to be creative. And which is why, you know, when the student said, well, you know, it's too dark on the Corniche, et cetera. Um, as I said, my experience has not been like that. I, I've walked there by myself and I've seen other, you know, women by themselves. And um, so it might apply in other places, but I think it would be, a, you know, a danger to say, you know, that there's not enough light and it's unsafe and to start putting lights everywhere on the Corniche because I actually, I actually think that's one of the qualities is the fact that, you know, that there's a certain space which is not very much lit up, um, you know, and I, and I think you're right, we have to, we really have to think about all the senses and, and be very careful of over-lighting, over-programming. And, you know, when you said it is a lot of spectacle, I mean, when I show those program, those projects, even for Lucille, et cetera, I'm not saying that I agree with it. I'm just saying that um, I, it's uh, in Qatar, it's the first time that they're doing a sort of master plan for lighting. So it can be a good thing, um, but it depends how it's done. It can also be overdone. Um, although in Lucille, in the plan, um, what I thought was interesting and I mentioned was you know, they have this, you know, the idea of dimming lights, the idea of switching on and off lights, you know, so they have sort of thought about that a little bit more, you know, and I feel that there is a consideration of, of having something more adjustable, something a bit more, um, a bit more refined, yeah. But it's a very good question, very important. Uh, my, my question is to Anna. Um, I was really very intrigued by the time lapse that you have shown and uh, also some images of the master plan um, and the way lighting is used, again, that the point you just mentioned uh, previously to uh, highlight the city and to make us appreciate the various architectural wonders that exist and to sort of emphasize the, the city as spectacle. And um, uh, it, it, it is, or, or one of the things that are immediately noticeable, there's the lack of people, and you're talking about, you know, lack of, that there is, you didn't do enough document, documentation, and there is, in fact, a lot of activities that happen. But my, my concern is with the vision that is behind that, in the sense that uh, lighting, uh, or lighting the city in that way, is a way to create these sort of uh, exclusive spaces where, uh, the marginalized and the low income and the workers are not really felt welcome because darkness in a way was their last vestige in, in, in a way to occupy the night. But now the night is being occupied and dominated by the city. And if I can draw a parallel to, to what Todd has shown us in, in, in Dubai where l lighting across the creek and so on was used as a way to introduce modernity to the city, which was a very different vision. So my concern is with the actual vision that is being perpetuated here, that we're simply using the, the, these new technologies and lighting as a way to glorify whatever is being done and, and at the cost of, of human, uh, human interaction and inclusiveness. Well, well thank you. Um, thank you for the comments. Um, uh, I, what, I, what I think is interesting is, is obviously Lucille is a master plan. You know, there is, there's a vision um, uh, for lighting. But what's interesting with the Corniche is that um, 
Uh, because I, I personally, I've, I'm, I'm also quite critical, but I haven't developed, uh, because this is very new for me, to look at the, the lighting aspect. Um, um, but what's interesting in the Corniche is that there is no, as yet, real master plan for the lighting. And the lighting is all, it's all these buildings competing with each other. And then, you know, the Sheraton has these beams of light and the, the museum is very nicely, you know, illuminated. Um, and in fact, where the people are hasn't really been thought about. And so it's still a little bit dark. Um, but as I said, I think, you know, I think it's maybe quite, you know, maybe it's good that way, that that, that actual space has not been over-designed and over-programmed um, for the moment. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it, I think having a critical look is, is, is you know, is that a good spectacle or not? And and I, I like to, you know, there's one of my favorite place is is there's a terrace and an Italian restaurant where the, the heron is. And I like to sit there, first of all, because there's a heron, which means, you know, there's, I think there's a good, you know, some kind of good ecology there. And, you know, there's urban biodiversity. And then you see the boats and you hear them, you know. So, so there is something, and it's totally, you know, it just depends on who's going to, hire the boat and you know so it's not programmed that part is not programmed of course you know the lighting of the the, the skyscrapers is more or less programmed but it's very individualistic um but i i think this you know these layers and this superposition is is you know is quite good so i i don't have an answer you know does it mean we should control more you know how much light is coming from the towers you know should we ask the boats you know to sort of tone it down or not so i don't really have an answer i think it's a really good question and um um, I, I just, I must say that I, I actually enjoy watching the spectacle. You know, maybe I'm not critical enough, but, but I think there's something um, uh, not totally orchestrated, which is actually quite attractive. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I answered you, but I think I, ha I have a lot more thinking to do about it. Uh, I have a question for Maha. Um, I actually been to that Starbucks a ridiculous number of times <laughs> um, because I taught in Alain. And what was I felt about Alain? It was a much more less well less program place. And is that because it's more Emirati or it's and you guys are driving the program rather than Westerners in Abu Dhabi? Um, well, the fact is, um, I think Sheikh Zayed. Um, he was the ruler of the Emirates, right? He was a resident of Adain. And one thing that he wanted to ensure, which is interesting, he wanted to preserve the culture in Adain. So, he, so there was this restriction, this building height restriction. So although Adain has the same oil revenues as Abu Dhabi, but it is not that metropolitan city if you compare Adain and Abu Dhabi. Um, and you're right, uh, Emiratis are attracted to that. Uh, it's, it's a more conservative society compared to Abu Dhabi. Um, and there's a lot of private villas. Um, so it's interesting that you say that we drive uh, the program. However, uh, for, for decades, I think, like Dubai had its first shopping mall in 1995, had it in 2001. Emiratis with the disposable income, they would go to Abu Dhabi or go to Dubai. So, for, so it's interesting, if that was true, Al Ain would have been developed faster um, when it comes to retail and all the glamorous things that Dubai and Abu Dhabi offers. Um, but what's interesting uh, also is that I talk about Al Jahli um, and I showed a couple of pictures and I say it's an inclusive space. Um, but I, I think someone would point out where are the Emiratis. Um, it is, the only thing is because it is situated where, as I mentioned, diversity is. So there's a lot of apartment buildings around. But uh, maybe I could tell you the example of a Tawaya Park, uh, which is in, a, in, in the Tawaya district that is majority Emirati. And when the fences went down, when the municipality decided that all the parks should not have fences, there was actually backlash from the community. They wanted the fences back up because of the privacy. Because women are more conservative. Um, and as I mentioned, there are certain days when um, uh, women are allowed in. That means that uh, boys, even at a certain age, are not allowed in. That means that women can enjoy public spaces without having 
without being covered. So that means that they shouldn't be wearing the shela or the hijab. Um, but a friend of mine, um, I was focusing on Al-Jahli Park for this, um, for this presentation, but a friend of mine said it was interesting that um, when she visited al Toya Park, just opposite of, of, of al Toya is a more low-income community. Um, uh, it's called El Marial, and just across the street, that's the district-level park. And sh she, she said it was amazing how you see everyone there. The Emiratis, because it was majority where, where they're living, and you can see the low-income families and, OCO, and also the individuals. Um, but to answer your question, I think um, I wouldn't say that we are driving it, uh, because it's not very evident, because we need all the glamour in the city. Um, but it, it, is, it is, as I mentioned, the culture is shifting. So we, you never know what happens next. Uh, there was a lot of pushback, as I mentioned, with, without the fences, and now they're accept, ex accepting it more. But um, public parks, as I mentioned, used to be popular. And the numbers, and the, the visitors to public park decreased since 2006. That's when the fences went down. And, but that's why, that's where the shopping malls uh, came about. So the number uh, per year was a, around a million um, the public visitors to public parks, and it, it's now constant uh, to around 600,000. Uh, so the municipality is trying to revitalize public parks because maybe you can say we have six regional malls, but it used to be historically where everyone goes. Um, and I think their solution, when I mentioned the Starbucks, it didn't actually come from planners. It actually it came from the investment part of the municipality. And as planners, uh, we didn't know that it would create this inclusivity, you know, the, the, an inclusive um, space. So it will be interesting to see because it is quite recent that the municipality uh, is asking to uh, make the park more mixed use. So we would um, plot, um, you know, if, um, retail plots or anything like gymnasiums, and, and so. So th this is what I meant by what we're trying to do is make the public parks more attractive um, by bringing in the retail experience. But maybe it is not the future. You never know. Any other question? Thank you all. If I may uh, just problematize a little bit on what Farah was noticing and perhaps actually going back to Yasser's question and his presentation yesterday and just actually go back to the notion of public and private, especially in the Gulf, in the Gulf region in general, not in one city. And that is to go back to the terrain vague or the third space notion. Um, is it possible just to speak for designers about designing for private and public in a community in which the public is defined differently as whether it's a native public or upper income expat or the guest workers? And is it possible for design to sort of like transcend the limitation of the definition of what is private and public from the perspective of the natives and start involving these terrain vagues, these, these uh, third spaces, and perhaps actually an inclusive look at what a public ought to be? Somewhat actually similar to what Maha is speaking about, but Maha is somehow sort of like speaking about it as an unintended result. I'm actually interested in the intended result and the possibility of including the unincluded. I, I think, that, I mean, Knowing a bit the, the golf, you know, uh, I think uh, this is one of the issues that the golf will need to tackle uh, in, in a very short future, especially because economically, if not, it will not survive. And I think they are losing a lot of uh, power, or mind, uh, but knowledge, you know, uh, only because of this interconnection in, the, in between the different communities. So I think that is one of the issues that us as practitioners, we definitely will need, and, and we are doing it, but you know, okay, uh, the golf also has a dynamic, a very slow dynamic to change things, but it's something that for us is going to be mandatory in, in very short, I mean, you see it in a very short future, because if not, 
we believe it's going to be very tough for, for the Gulf itself, no? for the economies of the Gulf to, to keep moving. And, and on top, the funny thing is that, for instance, in Kuwait, it's something that was present for centuries. So that relationship with the foreigners, no, in which it was not subdivision between locals and expats, or it was really one common space that disappeared with the development of the city. So recover that, I think, is, is a must. Yeah, just, I will. No, go ahead. Sorry, uh, no, I'm just thinking about it. Uh, if you look at a mosque. Okay, a mosque is actually a, a space where everyone connects. Of course, the, the segmentation between men and female happens just for religious reasons, but at the end you could be standing next to a person with a different background, different uh, wealth status, and it's quite an equal space in, term, in terms of status, in terms of even experience. Unfortunately, if you look at public malls, not everyone is welcome, although there is a sign outside. That there's no sign that says you cannot enter. And that becomes through intimidation, through maybe the type of architecture that we do, or even through the fences that we, the imaginary fences that are there. So for me, it's actually a society issue. It's not only just architecture. And that's where, there, that's where the break has to begin to happen. And the architecture will only work if the society begins to react. So, yeah. Yeah, just maybe. One, oh, no, I'm sorry. no, 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 go ahead. No, no I just wanted to also um, uh, add to that. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's really important. You, you mentioned the, the Terra Vague, and I think it's also a question of, of programming, of not over programming, because the Terra Vague means it's not. A space that's not programmed, especially for one person or another, or for retail, etc. Um, so I think, for for example, for me, the, the the Corniche, because that's what I've been looking at. I think it could be better designed um, for you know other, for the edge, you know, for more ecology, more access to water. But I don't think it should be over-programmed. You know, so when I see Arabs saying, yes, we need to activate more spaces through light and etc., I'm a bit wary because I think that's actually why the Corniche is. Is, that's why I love the Corniche. I mean, why I think it's a good public space because it's not over-programmed and everybody goes there. And you can see, and I should actually, you know, take more photos because, you know, a, a Friday morning at seven o'clock, there's Filipinos doing Zumba on the Corniche, you know. So it's, it's really active. And then, you know, there's fish, and there's Indian people fishing. And then, you know, so it's really, there's, there's great activities which I haven't, you know, yet documented. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, so as designers, we have to make the space, I would say, better functioning, more ecological, better climate, but we have to be careful maybe of the programming and then, you know, the exclusivity through the gentrification, I would say, yeah. But you're not fast before it's designed out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I need to sleep first, though, but I will. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add something to this. You know, we designers, we want to fix the world, and I think we have, a, you know, a very important role and, you know, a lot of power, but at the same time, you know, I think such a kind of a, you know, the performance and the success of a public space, we need to kind of zoom out and understand that we've, we've been looking at very central spaces and probably the people who are, you know, low income, they don't live in these spaces, they live in other communities. So we have to kind of uh, improve the, the planning so we can actually provide better accessibility at every possible sense. So it's not just economic accessibility, it's also physical transportation accessibility because in many of these places, it's like, yes, they're open, they're free, but they're actually inaccessible for many, you know, a large amount of people. So, yeah, the planning, I would say that is, is key, right? Is, actually, yeah. I, I'd like to pitch, pitch something in there that I, yes. I actually kind of disagree with That's you okay. in a point. Um, I think sometimes architects can begin to think as if they're, they're solving problems that haven't been designed. And a lot of these things are designed We've used these various terms to talk about spaces that aren't being used the way they were designed to be, to be used, but they were designed. And I think it's, um, at least what I tried to do with, with my students in architecture school is to, to, be, to, to stop seeing architects as this kind of uh, profession that is outside a, a larger constellation of consultants who are also designers. Management consultants are designers. Uh, infrastructure designers, engineers, they are also designers. And we're as much, they're as much part of that design process that we seem to so quickly forget in a building like this uh, that 
uh, that has an immediate relationship to how we uh, operate. And I think it actually requires us to begin to understand who our brethren are, our, our professional brethren, uh, in that sense, uh, before we start to say we want to make a, a solution, because mm -hmm. we're also part of the problem. Yeah, I agree. So. That's <laughs> Thank you all for, for the presentations. Um, in, in this line of thinking about private and public, though what these presentations uh, indicated to me is that we also need to, rather than say no boundary, as if no boundary somehow defined public, that as designers we really should unpack the questions of who the public is because it's not the same for the entire world. It needs a much more nuanced definition. And what Maha's beautiful presentation said to me is that perhaps the boundary is useful in some way that needs to be uh, made more complex, more nuanced, because every, everyone should be um, uh, allowed the, the comfort of feeling free. And that means in this country one thing, in New York another, uh, in Boston another, and, and certainly in, in the oasis in Alain must be something else. So these are all ideas that have a long genealogy and, um, and that we shouldn't really uh, do with, in the same way that we shouldn't insert technologies uncritically, we, we see the effect of that. We shouldn't do without certain concepts uncritically, but rather make them, make them even more useful. And I think the sense of the, of the more complex edge between sea and water to enable new ecologies, in fact, works socially as well. How do we think about public space? Uh, not in a, in a kind of black and white space, all light, no light, <laughs> all water, all fountain. What if you don't want to get wet? Goodness, you know, can you not go there? Uh, but rather think about, you know, what is uh, a more nuanced discussion about one boundaries, opacity, transparency, to enable multiple forms of being uh, across society in the same space. And in that sense, you know, the, the house, the houses are, yes, I was taken aback. I wouldn't call them public. It's, it's actually, you know, uh, I agree with Farah, kind of pro problematic to use that word. But families are microcosms of society. And I was very interested in, you know, what is that kind of architecture enabling in terms of a teenager rebelling against their parents, uh, uh, the kind of surveillance, you know, between generations. Um, because to me, that is a very interesting model then about that could be explored in a notion of the public outside. How much do you allow to happen? How much do you not? How do you begin to um, use the house as an experiment for a larger conversation? for us to be much more uh, heterogeneous or accepting of heterogeneity uh, in the world. Okay. Right. So when, when are we coming back to you? <laughs> yeah, so we need to get at 2 o'clock. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.